Uh, welcome everyone to the Whitney and Bethany, uh, Betty McMillan Center for International Area Studies at Yale. We are delighted today to be able to host an Ambassador Marwan Mwasha, uh, as this year's Henry L. Stimson Lecturer. The Stimson Lecture Series is named for Henry Simpson, class of Yale College of 1889, an attorney and statesman whose government service culminated uh, with his tenure of Secretary of War during World War II. Um, since 1998, the Macmillan Center and Yale University Press have had an arrangement in which lectures by distinguished diplomats and foreign policy experts invited by the center are then published by Yale University Press. Previous Stimson lectures have included uh, Political Order in Changing Societies by Samuel Huntington and um, Arms and Influence by Thomas Schelling. Ambassador Mwasha is a Jordanian national whose career has spanned the areas of development, diplomacy, civil society, and communications. He began his career as a journalist for the Jordan Times and then served from 1985 to 1990 at the Ministry of Planning. In 1995, Ambassador Mwasha opened Jordan's first embassy in Israel, and in 1996, he became Minister of Information <coughs> and the government's first, uh, the government spokesman. From 1997 to 2002, he served in Washington as ambassador, negotiating the first free trade agreement between the United States and an Arab nation. He then returned to Jordan to serve as foreign minister, where he's been deeply involved in the peace process. In 2004, he became deputy prime minister responsible for reform and government performance and led the effort to produce a 10-year development strategy that included, among other topics, major recommendations on political and economic reform, financial services, fiscal reforms, employment, education, and training. Ambassador, will give, uh, Ambassador Mwasha will give two lectures. The title of the talk today is Moderation and the Search for Peace in, in the Middle East, and its subject, as the title suggests, is peace negotiations uh, and everything that surrounds them. The second lecture, which will be next week on the 25th of September here at, in the McMillan at 4 o'clock again, will be called the Slow Process of Arab, Arab Reform, which will deal with reform uh, in our political systems. Both lectures center on his new book, The Arab Center, The Promise of Moderation, University rules to Jonathan Brent's chagrin, perhaps, prevent us from selling books uh, on campus. Um, and so uh, this is a, a book tour without a book stand outside, for which I apologize. But uh, you should all, I think, go down to the bookstore uh, and get yourselves a copy after this. I will say that uh, the ambassador will speak for about 40 to 45 minutes, and then we will have about a half an hour for uh, questions, comments, and discussion. And then there'll be a reception outside to which uh, you're all invited. So nobody came here to listen to me. I'll stop at this point. But I'm very pleased to introduce Ambassador Mwasha. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here again at Yale. Uh, the book is published by Yale University Press, by the way. <coughs> uh, it's not easy to be a mother in the Middle East these days. Uh, it has been called a, a leap of faith sometimes, an act of courage, or just plain suicide. But there has never been a time, in my opinion, where moderation is more needed in our area than today. This is a book about Arab mothers, their successes as well as their failures. And uh, I talk about two principal issues in the book, that of peace and Arab uh, moderates' attempts to uh, bring about a peaceful resolution to the Arab-Israeli conflict, as well as the issue of reform, where I believe Arab moderates have failed the most in instituting a real and serious political reform process in the Middle East. Most Arab politicians 
kiss and don't tell, as I say. They uh, serve in government usually for a long time, but when they leave, they rarely record their experiences. And of those they, who do, uh, very few of them do it in English. As a result, the history of the region has largely been written by outsiders. There are very few books, if any, written by Arab practitioners, people who have been inside the room giving an Arab perspective on uh, developments of concern to the Middle East. This book, again, is an attempt to reverse this trend and to uh, 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 give a Western reader a perspective of some of the Arab dynamics uh, that have went on the moderate versus the radical position in the Arab world and where the moderates have been able to feed successes and where they really also fail uh, to do so. Because contrary to Western conventional wisdom, that Israel was the only one that always sought peace with the Arab world, while the Arab, uh, while the Arab world was never forthcoming on peace, I attempt to show through first-hand account in this book some of the efforts that the Arab Center has put on the table in order to bring about such a peaceful resolution to the conflict. But the book starts with a rather personal journey through this Arab Center, my time uh, uh, in Israel as Jordan's first ambassador. And even though I was before then the uh, Jordanian spokesman to the peace talks, which started in Madrid and then moved to Washington. And even though I had dealt with Israelis, of course, extensively, the idea of going there and living in what was, you, what was an enemy state for many, many years was not an idea that uh, was easy to accept, neither for me individually, nor for most Arabs, nor for Arab countries in general. And the chapter on Israel attempts to portray this human side of the conflict and attempts to show, again to a Western reader, some of the dilemmas, some of the leaps of faith that not only individuals such as myself will have to make, but also countries in the Middle East if we are to bring about indeed peace in the region that will be sustained. I would like to uh, I don't know if this is conventional, but I would like to read a paragraph from the book uh, uh, that attempts to uh, explain some of the dilemmas uh, that, uh, that someone like me had to, uh, uh, had to, had to uh, overcome. Uh, to the West, uh, being asked to be Jordan's ambassador you know, to, to Israel was a big honor. To me, it truly really uh, took a lot of soul searching before I was able to uh, accept. I talk in this paragraph about the first time I attended Israel's Independence Day two or three weeks after I came to Israel as ambassador. First major test of my diplomatic skills came sooner than I expected. Less than three weeks after I arrived, Israel celebrated its independence. In any other country, this is a joyous occasion celebrated by the diplomatic corps. But to Arabs, and particularly to Jordanians, this was the anniversary of the Nakba, the catastrophe, when Israel won the 1948 war and most Palestinians lost their homes and became refugees. For Arabs, Israeli independence is no cause for celebration. President Ezer Wiseman at the time hosted a reception at his house in Jerusalem, as he did each year for the diplomatic corps. I attended with great apprehension. Thinking that my face was still unknown, I hid behind the veteran Egyptian ambassador, Hamad Basuni, who had been there for 16 or 17 years, and hoped to manage with a handshake with President Wiseman and make a quick exit. As soon as the president saw me, he raised his glass of wine and announced to the crowd his great joy that the Jordanian ambassador, for the first time in Israel's history, was present. Nearly 20 television cameras fixed on me. <laughs> Correspondents asked how I felt. 
I could not say I was happy because that would offend every Jordanian and Arab. <laughs> and as ambassador, I could not say I was sad for fear of, of offending the Israelis. So I said that I hoped the day would come when all the peoples in this region could celebrate their independence. The moment passed, but the scene of how I was to behave was set. I moved from this journey through the Arab Center to the last six months of King Hussein uh, uh, and his efforts to consolidate an Arab Center uh, that is based on peaceful relations. Uh, he was in the States, of course, uh, in his last six months uh, getting treatment for his cancer, and I was then the Jordanian ambassador, ambassador to the U.S. and witnessed some unique events during that time, including not only his efforts to facilitate the Y River Agreement between the Palestinians and the Israelis, but also his decision to change the line of succession and what that meant uh, for him and for the Arab Center as well. But there is a big chunk of the book that is devoted to the period between 2000 to 2000 to this day of peacemaking. And it's a period that, to my knowledge, has not been covered not just by an Arab, but by anyone, uh, including by Americans who were involved in peacemaking uh, during that era. I talk about two principal initiatives, both of which were put forward by the Arab Center. When I speak about an Arab Center, I mean Arab moderates, uh, were put on the table to advance uh, the cause of peacemaking. First, the Arab Peace Initiative of 2002, the initiative that was started by then Crown Prince Abdullah of Saudi Arabia uh, and that was unanimously passed by all Arab states in Beirut in 2002. Little has been said, unfortunately, about this peace initiative, either in the West or in our area, and that is partly, you know, uh, 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 we are partly as Arabs to blame for it. But I would like to highlight some of the key points behind this initiative because I believe it is the most important development that has taken place in this decade as far as Arab peacemaking, Arab Israeli peacemaking is concerned. For the first time in the conflict, for the first time in the conflict, Arabs put forward an initiative that does not only address Arab needs, a Palestinian state and ended occupation, a two-state solution, but also Israeli needs as well. The Arab Peace Initiative put on the table four major offerings to Israel. The first is a collective peace treaty and normal relations, not between Israel and neighboring Arab states with which Israel has a territorial dispute, but also between Israel and every single member of the Arab League, every, all 22 of them. The second is collective security guarantees. Again, where Israel's security would be assured not by its neighboring states, not by the Palestinians, not by the Syrians alone, but by all members of the Arab League. Satisfying a key average Israeli demand for security that I personally witnessed when I served as ambassador. The third is an offer to end the conflict and have no further claims, meaning that in return for a two-state solution, there will be no pre-67 claims by Arabs on Israel's territory. And the fourth and most important is an agreed solution to the refugee problem, sending a clear message to Israel that Arabs are not talking about bringing back four million Palestinian refugees into the Israeli state. In all my talks, in all my talks to Israelis, I have always posed this question. If we have missed a need through the Arab Peace Initiative, if we have missed an Israeli need, please let me know. So that we make sure to include it. And not one single Israeli so far has come up with a need that was not in the Arab Peace Initiative. And yet, this initiative was neither taken seriously 
by the Bush administration or by the Israeli government. The Bush administration, for the longest time until Annapolis last year, had this notion that it is better to let the parties simmer in their own juices. And this abandonment of peacemaking, of any engagement by the Bush administration in peacemaking has truly made the uh, 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 situation deteriorate to an alarming degree. And Israel also did not take the Arab Peace Initiative uh, 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 seriously. And uh, as a result, as a result, we did not make much progress, even though the initiative still is on the table. And even though, with all the violence of the last six years, not one Arab country has withdrawn its signature from this issue. Well, we tried further after O2. And after President Bush uh, gave his famous speech of June 24, 2002, in which he laid out a vision for a Palestinian state in three years that is based on performance and uh, 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 also called for a new, a new Palestinian leadership, the uh, toppling of Arafat, and the election of more moderate Palestinians to take over. The Arabs, in particular Jordan, which is uh, now uh, known as a fact it was not known then, uh, suggested the idea of a roadmap, which evolved to become uh, what we all know today as the Middle East roadmap. An idea to translate President Bush's vision into a series of practical steps that would take us from where we were to a Palestinian state at the end of the occupation in three years. And we insisted on three major principles that were all included in uh, uh, the roadmap. First, a gradual approach that starts with addressing Israel's security needs and the dismantling of the uh, radical Palestinian uh, uh, groups, they stop the suicide bombings, etc., and ends with giving the Palestinian the political political horizon that they needed through a Palestinian state uh, and an end to the occupation in three years. But we also insisted on a monitoring mechanism, so that there is a third party that can serve as a judge to determine whether the two parties were meeting their commitments under the roadmap or not. Israel would have none of that, and as a result, uh, this monitoring mechanism, which was the quartet and which was mentioned in the, in the Middle East roadmap, was never activated, and as a result, the roadmap also never saw the light, even after it was launched in Aqaba, Jordan. Uh, in, uh, in June of 2003. The book shows in detail not only that on peace there was an Arab center, but that the, this center really fought hard the radical positions within the Arab world, those of the Syrians, of the Libyans, of the Iraqis at the time, and won the day and got a unanimous agreement on both the Arab Peace Initiative and the Middle East Roadmap, despite the fact that there was a very vocal and strong radical position within the Arab world that did not want this to go through. Uh, but despite this, as I said, we were able to win the day at least then and put these two initiatives forward. Unfortunately, of course, neither initiative was implemented and as a result today, as a result today, Arab moderates, at least on peace, have nothing to show for their efforts. If peace remains elusive in the Middle East today, it is not because of the lack of trying on part of Arab moderates. They have been very serious in putting on the table all of the initiatives that I talked about, uh, very serious about engaging with the Israelis and the Americans and the international community. Uh, and uh, despite that fact, today we are as far away from peace as we were 10 years ago. Where are we today? 
Well, Arafat passed away. And the Palestinians elected the most moderate Palestinian leader in, you know, their history, and I dare say, in the future also. And yet, yet we are all guilty of not supporting Abu Mazen, Mahmoud Abbas. Neither the Bush administration, which pushed hard to get rid of Arafat, and argued that until a moderate Palestinian leader comes, it will not be able to lift a finger to help end the Arab-Israeli conflict. The Bush administration did not lift a finger to help Arafat, uh, to help Abu Mazen. Israel certainly did not lift a finger, and Arab states, or some Arab states, did not do so either. And today, again, Abu Mazen is very much on the defensive. He has nothing to show for his people. He could not even lift one checkpoint from the 500 checkpoints that Israel has in the West Bank and Gaza. And as a result, again, Arab moderates today are very much on the defensive. The Bush doctrine, excuse my uh, uh, use of the expression, of letting the uh, <laughs> parties simmer in their own juices uh, was reversed uh, last year and uh, the Bush administration decided that it wanted to give it a try and attempt to solve the Palestinian-Israeli conflict uh, uh, in its last year uh, in office. I don't know why American presidents attempt to do so, uh, but history has shown us all, every single American administration, every single American president, who attempted to solve this conflict in his last year, failed to do so. <laughs> despite all the efforts by President Clinton, despite the current efforts by President Bush, you do not leave the parties on their own for seven years and then come in the eighth year and expect things miraculously to happen. All successful interventions by U.S. Presidents have come in their first in their first term. Whether it is President Carter and the Camp David Accords in 1978 that led to peace between Egypt and Israel, or whether it is President Bush Senior with the Madrid Peace Conference that led to the present uh, uh, long round of negotiations, both these efforts came from presidents in their first term. And so, if I can make a modest a modest prediction, I would predict that the current effort will fail and uh, the new administration will have to deal with the Arab-Israeli conflict again. So how, how do we move forward? I believe that America, which in the last seven or eight years has really focused its efforts in the Middle East, on Iraq, Iran, and Afghanistan, has tended to compartmentalize these issues, to deal with the issue of peace as if it is totally separate from reform, as if it is totally separate from terrorism. And the results have been clear to us all. All these issues have very clear interlinkages. And unless we deal with them in a comprehensive manner and understand that peace affects the process of reform and affects the process of, or the fight against terrorism, if we don't understand that. And if America continues to compartmentalize issues, we will continue to have one failure after the other. But on peacemaking in particular, I will argue that the gradual approach to peacemaking, and I'm a product of this gradual approach, I'm a product of the Oslo process of 15 years of negotiations between the parties. This gradual approach which preached that you deal with the easier issues first and you build trust through that among the parties until such a time when the trust allows you to uh, uh, tackle the more difficult issues such as Jerusalem or refugees or an end to the occupation. This gradual approach has exhausted all its possibilities. Yes, there is no question in my mind that it has achieved 
many successes in mutual recognition among the parties, in the breakdown of barriers, in negotiations between the Palestinians and the Israelis, but also between uh, 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 Israel and, and uh, some other Arab states, in the peace treaty between Israel and Jordan. Despite all these successes, today, 15 years later, mutual trust among the parties is at an all-time low. And I doubt that any amount of negotiation between the two parties will get us nearer to a, 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 a final settlement that is different from what the parties have already agreed to through negotiations among them. I will uh, claim that we are not in need of a political solution because such a political solution exists today. It exists not because of an imposition from the United States or anyone, but because of negotiations of frameworks that have been arrived at among the parties themselves. When President Clinton offered the Clinton parameters at the end of his presidency in 2000, he did not have the luxury of prior negotiations on final status among the parties themselves. He had to, I don't want to say make them up, but he had to guess what the red lines are, and he came up with, with parameters that were not, uh, in fact, were not bad at all. But since then, the Israelis and the Palestinians came up with a number of frameworks through the Tabato, the Geneva document, a number of documents between Palestinian officials and Israeli officials. And the Arabs, which is the most important, have changed the goalposts through offering not peace between Israel and the Palestinians, but between Israel and the whole Arab world through the Arab Peace Initiative. These are all excellent sets of frameworks that can serve as a basis for a solution. What we need is the political will by the United States and the international community to move from conflict management to conflict resolution. Because if we don't do that, and if we don't do that quickly, the, the, the radical forces in the Arab world are rising at an alarm strain. And next time you want to have negotiations among the parties, you will not be talking to moderates like me. You will be talking to the radicals for the foreseeable future. This notion, which in fact has been <coughs> suggested by the Clinton, uh, uh, peace-making uh, team, that America cannot want peace more than the parties themselves, is a wrong notion. America not only can, it must. It must because radicalism and terrorism in the region is now affecting, as we all have seen post-September 11, is directly affecting U.S. national interests. And unless we change our mindset and we move to conflict resolution, through the sets of frameworks that I talked about, I believe that we will have to deal with the radicals for a long time to come. A two-state solution that I'm talking about is not a sellout of Israel, as many in the United States would have us believe. A two-state solution is ironically today, not just in the interests of Arabs and Palestinians, it is directly in the interests of Israel. And I'll tell you why. Not just because of radicalism, but because of the demographic problem. Today, Israel faces a situation where the number of Arabs under Israel's control, whether they are the 1.3 million Arabs in Israel proper, Israeli citizens, or the 3.5 million Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza, 4.8 million Arabs that Israel today controls, equals the number of Jews in the Israeli state today. In the near future, you're going to have a situation where the number of Arabs will outnumber the number of Jews in the Israeli state. And if a two-state solution is not possible, what other 
uh, what other uh, options does Israel have? A one-state solution in which Israel gives equal rights to all its citizens, it runs directly against the raison d'etre of the Israeli state as a Jewish state, a, st a solution that Israel simply will not accept. An indefinite occupation for you know, the foreseeable future, it will result in not just frustration, but in frustration that, act, that leads to terrorism, that leads to violence for the foreseeable future. What option do we have if we do not go for a two-state solution? But so that I'm not accused of telling Israel what is in its interests, I chose in the book to read what Rabin gave in his final statement to the Knesset, in which he passed Oslo, or, or uh, succeeded in passing Oslo B in the Knesset in 1995, by a vote of 61 to 59. 61 to 59, and no one accused Rabin of being a weak prime minister. So to answer the critics that say that peace today is not possible because we have a, a weak Palestinian government and we have a weak Israeli government, and we need to wait until both governments are strong and we have a willing and able US administration, and then peace is possible. My answer is, if we want to wait that long, we will never have this. Because the status quo is not frozen in the Middle East, and the forces of radicalism are not just on the rise, but are today the most popular in the region. Let me, tell, let me uh, just uh, read quickly what, what Rabin uh, had to say in his final address to the Kines. <clears throat> we did not return to an empty land. There were Palestinians here who struggled against us for a hundred wild and bloody years. Many thousands on both sides were killed in the battle over the same land, over the same strip of territory, and were joined by the armies of the Arab states. Today, after innumerable wars and bloody incidents, we ruled more than two million Palestinians through the IDF. This is in 95. Today, they are 3.5 and run their lives by a civil administration. This is not a peaceful solution. We can continue to fight. We can continue to kill and continue to be killed. But we can also try to put a stop to this never-ending cycle of blood. We can also give peace a chance. He goes on. We preferred a Jewish state, even if not on every part of the land of Israel, to a binational state which would emerge with the annexation of 2.2 million Palestinian residents of the Gaza Strip and West Bank. Like I said, they are now 3.5. We had to choose between the whole of the land of Israel, which meant a binational state, and whose population as of today would comprise 4.5 million Jews and more than 3 million Palestinians, and a state with less territory but which would be a Jewish state. We chose to be a Jewish state. We chose a Jewish state because we are convinced that a binational state with millions of Palestinian Arabs will not be able to fulfill the Jewish role of the state of, the is of Israel, which is the state of the Jews. Today, of course, we've heard similar statements, both from ex-Prime Minister Sharon and Prime Minister Olmer uh, to, to the same effect. Unless we have a two-state solution, Israel today is in deep trouble, not only the Palestinians. Despite all this, as I've said at the beginning of the lecture, the Arab center today is deeply in trouble. The Arab center today is very much on the defensive in the Arab world. And why? Because so far it has been a one-dimensional center. It has been a center which has primarily focused on the issue of peace. And despite its valiant efforts, it has not been able to bring this peaceful settlement uh, to Arab society. But it has failed to address other issues of importance to Arab society. 
political reform, good governance, economic well-being, and cultural diversity. And because it has neither solved the Arab-Israeli conflict nor addressed these issues, it has nothing to show today for its efforts. And as a result, it is a center that has lost its credibility. My main argument in the book, other than the issue of peace, is that for this center to hold, to prosper, to be uh, successful and credible in the future, it cannot rest on the pillar of peace alone. It has to rest also on the other pillar of reform. So far, it has not done so. <coughs> and so far, Arab moderates on peace have, by and large, not been moderates on reform, have not even addressed this issue, has been largely silent on the need for a reform process in the Arab world. And in the ne next week in my lecture, I will go into this issue of Arab reform and the slow process of Arab reform in, 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 in great detail and uh, first uh, attempt to explain why Arabs have not been uh, 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 forthcoming on reform, why the Arab world today is lagging behind most of the other regions of the world, if not all of the other regions of the world, in terms of good governance and what can be done to institute uh, a process where an Arab center emerges that is pluralistic, in other words, that believes in political and cultural diversity at all times, that is peaceful, in other words, believes in peaceful existence regionally, but also domestically, and where political forces domestically do not carry arms, and inclusionist in that it really accepts and includes all the ethnic and religious groups and communities in the Middle East. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Um, so now we, we have some time for questions and discussion. And uh, the world is open. Yes, sir. I am an Arab, and I have a question like we are talking about the Arab center, like in Kabul, more than one little on the level of delivering on the peace and, uh, you know, with, uh, ending the occupation on the level of reform, on the level of democracy, on the level of, of uh, development. Actually, there is nothing that this center uh, uh, has to demonstrate either to the Arabs or to the West, like on the level of democracy and uh, moderation or development or the, to the Arabs on the level of the national conflict with Israel. So how can, uh, like, why should the West keep supporting this center, and why should the Arabs not move towards more radicalization, given that uh, we have a clear now uh, alternative with Hezbollah? Yeah. So, so where is this Arab center going? Well, there are two schools of thought uh, in the Arab world. Uh, one that says that violence is the only way to go. And therefore, uh, 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 you know, uh, moderation has not, as you said, uh, uh, succeeded in bringing uh, a, a resolution of the Arab Syrian conflict. And therefore, uh, the way to go is with violence. I strongly object to that. And I will continue to object to it till the end of my life. Because I don't believe in violence as a way to <coughs> develop a healthy society. And because I believe that once you accept violence as a tool towards meeting your political objectives, you are necessarily an exclusionist society. And the results are today clear to us all. The Arab world today is lagging behind all regions of the world. We are increasingly introvert. We are increasingly not dealing with the rest of the civilizations of the world. We seem to think at times that we are at the center of the universe, and the results are clear. It's not like Arabs are, you know, it's not like the violent uh, 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 theory of people like Hamas and Hezbollah are taking us to the, you know, forefront of civilization uh, in the world. It is not. My 
suggestion is more of moderation, not less of moderation, but moderation that is not selective. Moderation that does not only apply itself to the issue of peace and ignores the issue of reform and the issue of pluralism. Uh, uh, that is uh, uh, an ambitious project, and that is a project that will take 40 or 50 years. I'm not an idealist, and I don't think that you, you know, like others maybe uh, did, that you that democracy springs overnight because you throw a dictator. Uh, that uh, we have all seen uh, is not the case. <coughs> democracy is not just about throwing a dictator and replacing him. It is not just about free elections either. Uh, you have to install the pillars of democracy from uh, you know judicial independence to freedom of the press to women's empowerment to the belief that not only majority, uh, 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 not only in majority rule, but in minority and individual rights. And if you don't believe in that, then you are talking about an autocracy. You're not talking about it. This is the suggestion that I have, and people like me have. And I am the first to tell you that we are a minority today in the Arab world. Uh, uh, but if the, op the option, if the alternative is to choose violence, then allow me to uh, 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 strongly disagree with this option. Yes, sir. Um, I'm curious to know, you know, in the framework you described, where the Muslim Brotherhood might fall. I did, you know, cursory research on it last year. I know that 60 years ago they were assassinating Egyptian political figures, but that, you know, since then they've undergone a huge transformation and they're present all over the Middle East to make different forms. I understand that some branch of them are members of the Jordanian legislature, mm -hmm. and that another manifestation of the Muslim Brotherhood is, of course, Hamas in Palestine. So, you know, it, it seems like it may not be essentially a uh, dichotomy, either accepting violence or rejecting all violence. It might be a little bit more of a spectrum. And might you comment on how the Muslim Brotherhood would fit into that? I think when we talk about political Islam, there's a tendency in the West to treat political Islam as monolith, as all belonging to one group, when this is clearly not the case. And if you allow me, I'm, I'm glad you asked this question, if you allow me to try to divide political Islam in the Middle East into at least three groups. The first is what I will call the exclusionist group. This is a group at war with the whole world. This is Al-Qaeda types. They don't believe in dialogue. They don't believe in compromise. They're not against the West, they're against everybody who does not believe in their very strict interpretation of Islam. And they believe in violent means. And everything is permitted if you don't agree with them. This is a group with which no compromise is possible because they are not interested in compromise. This is a group that must be fought. But it is the tiniest group in political Islam in the Arab world. You have the second group, which is the in-between. Okay, This is the Hamas and Hezbollah of this world. These are people who also employ violent means, who also carry arms. But their theater of operation is lim limited, not to the whole world, but to the world in which they have an occupation, in the West Bank and Gaza or in uh, Lebanon. They also have one arm inside the system. They are both part of the a political process in their respective countries, in the, in, the, in the Palestinian legislature and in the Lebanese legislature, <coughs> but they also carry arms. So they're, you know, they're neither uh, inside the system nor outside. And then you have the third group, which has, which is the peaceful, group, which has always been peaceful. Some of them have advocated positions no less hardline than the second group, or maybe the third, well, the second group. But they have always uh, 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 employed peaceful means. The Muslim Brotherhood in Jordan comes to mind. Uh, some of the uh, political Islamic parties in Morocco, in Yemen, and elsewhere in the Arab world. And my argument is that you need to encourage the second group to migrate to the third while we fight the first. But we cannot deal with political Islam as if it is monolithic. I think there are two principles, I'll talk about this uh, at length next, uh, next week. 
there are two principal values that must be adhered to by secular and religious parties alike. And I don't uh, limit these to, to religious parties. All, all, all political parties in the Arab world must adhere to these two principles. One is peaceful means. You cannot be a political party and carry out. You cannot dictate your views by force. Only the state carries arms. If you do that, if you allow yourself to carry arms as a party within the state, you are allowing that right to other political parties, and then it's a formula for civil war. It's not a formula for it. And you have to also uh, 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 commit to the principle of political and cultural diversity at all times. Meaning that you don't use you know, democracy to come to power once, and then you deny others the right to do so, and you don't uh, 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 submit all, all society to your cultural or even religious views. Because if you don't respect individual or minority rights, you are again not talking about a pluralistic inclusionist system you are talking about an autocratic system. If these two principles are adhered to, then I would consider secular or religious parties to be part of the set. Uh, you know, uh, the, 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 the Islamists are ruling in uh, Turkey today. But I consider them part of the set because they employ peaceful means and because they believe in a peaceful rotation of power. Forest. Oh, I wonder how you would conceptually define moderation and radicalism, because it actually much hinges on the understanding of those terms. Because if moderation is defined purely negatively in terms of you know avoidance of some extremes like the Aristotelian mean of uh, definition of mean like you know avoidance of excess and uh, and, uh, and insufficiency. This is a purely negative definition, which doesn't convey uh, the understanding of some positive term uh, or ends or aims which the moderates uh, should pursue, maybe resolutely. And uh, if uh, you define uh, moderation in some positive, primarily ethical terms, like well, non-violence or inclusiveness, uh, I assume that those goals may be pursued through very radical politics and they may imply some very radical confrontations with the enemies of well, inclusiveness or, or toleration or whatever, let alone the problem of reforms, which uh, I believe may involve very radical confrontations with some wilders, with some current wilders of power. So in this sense, moderation would turn itself into radicalism, but defined well in some well, substantive way. I believe in three, I, I, I believe I've put it in very positive terms. I'll, I'll give you three values that I believe the center should subscribe to. Should be pluralistic, meaning believe in pluralism at all times. Should be peaceful, you carry out your objectives through peaceful means. And it should be inclusion. You include all of your ethnic and uh, religious uh, groups in your society. These are the three values that, to me, define the center. It is not a center that is uh, along secular or religious lines. Religion is a very important part uh, uh, in politics in the Middle East, and I, 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 I think it will remain so for a very long time. So we cannot talk about a separation of church and state in the Western sense, but we certainly can talk about a pluralistic, peaceful, and inclusionist society. I don't see uh, 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 why uh, we cannot do that at all. We cannot talk about it as if all of this is going to come overnight. Again, you know, when you talk about uh, about uh, uh, about confrontation with the uh, ruling uh, elite, which today, of course, does not want any reform process in the Arab world because they understand too well that this will come at their own expense. But I'm not a proponent of, uh, 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 you know, of, a, of an overnight uh, confrontation because it doesn't work. Democracy is an evolutionary process. It has been an evolutionary <coughs> process everywhere else in the world. The Arab world is no exception. We cannot just, uh, you know, assume that uh, free elections will result in democracy in the Arab world. Because as you know, 
democracy is a lot more than free elections. It's a lot more. You had free elections in Iran, right? And then what happened? And then and then other other forces were denied the right politically organized. So it's not about just free elections. It's about instituting all the pillars of democracy, which will take a long time. But it must be started. And the problem with the political elite, in my opinion, in the Arab world today, is that they don't want to start at all. Their principal uh, theory is, if you open up the system, the Islamists come in, they tell you. And therefore, don't open up the system. What the reformists are saying is, if you don't open up the system, maybe not the Islamists, but the radicals will come in. But you open up the system gradually, not necessarily. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, when you discussed uh, the internal reforms, I, I think you left out, probably just accidentally, economics. Uh, better jobs, education, use of uh, modern technology, and perhaps also the use of that oil money to lessen the gap rather than increase the gap between different... Uh, well, uh, I, I left out all these and more only because this is the subject of next week's lecture. <laughs> uh, and I, I meant to uh, focus this week's lecture on the efforts to bring about peace in the Middle East. I will talk about all these. Uh, in my opinion, one of the major challenges in that world is education reform. I'll talk about it next week. Uh, and, and the quality of education, not the quantity of education. But I, I agree with you, sir, about all the points. I will, I will certainly deal with them all. So I encourage you to attend next week's lecture as well. <laughs> so let me then just intervene for a minute and, and follow out the logic of, of what you were saying about peace negotiations, which I found very persuasive. I, I found very persuasive your argument that uh, without a huge American commitment, there won't be a successful resolution of negotiations. I also thought your point was very well taken that um, presidents such as Carter and now Bush too, uh, uh, such as, as uh, Clinton and now Bush too, that try to do this on the way out of the White House don't get anywhere. And I, I thought your point was also well taken that it was it was presidents Carter and Bush one that that made big progress and they did this in the first term. But what you neglected to say was neither of them had a second term. And um, particularly now, uh, for the evolution of American politics has made it virtually impossible, at least in the mindsets of people who run political campaigns, it's made it virtually impossible for an American president who's running for re-election uh, to think that they can afford to lose Florida. Um, in, a, in an American election that essentially Middle East, what America can, can do in the Middle East is now hostage to the politics of re-election in Florida. And it's just the reality, and this is why, uh, say, even uh, Obama now, who's been quite uh, progressive in the traditional democratic sense on many issues, is, is you know, running a very pro-Israel uh, foreign policy, and even if you know if we have an Obama administration, uh, I don't think it'd be realistic to anticipate that that would change before the 2004 election were over. And I think the same thing would be true with the McCain administration. So if if you take all of that as more or less given, um, and we and we agree with your analysis, what we're really looking at is no prospects for serious American pressure to bring a resolution before 2005, uh, no matter who is elected. Excuse me, 2012, I mean, sorry. No matter who is elected. So, um, if, that, if that's broadly correct, what does that mean in terms of your analysis? Does it mean that uh, you should nonetheless be pushing this moderate uh, Arab agenda because otherwise things will get even worse. And so you're doing it, but knowing you just got your fingers in the dike and it's a holding pattern. 
or does it does it perhaps mean that uh, the moderate Arab center, rather than spending four years um, not delivering, uh, and therefore losing even more legitimacy, should focus on other things, maybe reform uh, the economy and and just take it as a given that the peace process is going. Well, you raise some extremely good points. Uh, I'm often reminded of the first point, that neither Bush uh, senior nor uh, Carter had a second term. But I strongly object, not, I mean, disagree, and uh, you might as well, that the reason they did not have a second term was the Arab Israeli party. I think, uh, you know, Carter had a million other reasons, the Iranian crisis, the, the economy, uh, 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 as, as did Bush, Bush Sr. I do not think that a majority of Americans opted away from Carter or Bush Sr. because of the Madrid Peace Conference or because of the Camp David Accords. That's my first point. Second point is, I agree with you that both candidates, if you notice both candidates today, Obama and McCain, have said very little on the Arab Israeli conflict. Very little. I mean, even somebody like me who is following this on a daily basis cannot really tell okay, where the two candidates really stand on Arab-Israeli peacemaking. And uh, it's a sign of the times, as you said, but we need to change how we frame the issue. Because if we frame the issue that uh, uh, solving the Arab-Israeli conflict is against the, you know, the, the pro-Israel lobby here, we're getting it wrong. This is what I'm saying. I mean, what I'm saying is this is a win-win situation. It's not a si You don't make the Arabs win by ending the occupation. You make the Israelis win too. Because if you don't affect a two-state solution, Israel is in big trouble today. And I would claim, as you said, maybe, maybe reality is that the, the, the new administration will not touch this issue for, you know, many years. And maybe uh, both uh, uh, campaigns will uh, advise the president that he has to deal with Afghanistan and he has to deal with Iraq and what to do with it and he has to deal with the Iranian nuclear option and a million other things in the Middle East before he comes to Arab-Israeli uh, peacemaking. And that's probably what they will do. That's probably what they will do. What I'm saying is if that is the case, you will not have a chance to solve it in 2000 in my opinion. There won't be a two-state solution that is possible in 2012. And maybe, maybe I don't want to be over dramatic, there won't be moderates to talk to in the Arab world to solve the conflict in 2012. So even if you want to solve it then, your ability to do so will be severely uh, uh, diminished uh, if uh, it is not uh, paid attention to at the very uh, early stage. But still in this discussion of the peace process, the, the elephant in the room, so to speak, is, is Jerusalem. You don't have any vision on either side, including Arab moderates, about what to do with Jerusalem in terms of really bringing out the table beyond what sounds like, in terms of the conflict, the most intractable, whether or not there's, I mean, I don't think any Israeli camp really believes we're bringing a full return of 1967 lines. I don't think any Arab camp at this point, at least in terms of their own political popularity, can ever see it. Um, to surrendering it, the internationalization has been dropped. You 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 create a picture of the Arab Peace Initiative as such that you know there's no remaining issues on the table. But it's seen the largest and probably the most relevant in terms of American circles. If your ultimate argument is that we need to help, is it is actually still to delay and intractable. And the second issue that would that held it up was this issue of sort of credible commitment, meaning that yeah okay it's great that all these countries great that Jordan wants peace. But provided that non-state actors, not state-based actors, are the states are unable to rein them in, right? You still do have terrorism as a non-state-based contingency. All of those moderate efforts didn't nail the two primary issues. So at that point, the question has to be thrown back in the Arab moderates: When are those? When will that ever be addressed? Let me attempt to tell you what the solution will look like. And. Uh, I'm not making this up. Every single word that I tell you is a result of negotiations. 
yes, not always negotiations that ended with the signing of a pen, but nevertheless very serious negotiations that left no stone unturned. And I will attempt to tell you not just on Jerusalem, but on everything else as well. Let's start with the Palestinian state borders. You will have 97% of the West Bank as we know it today given back to the Palestinians. The 3% which will be given to Israel, the settlement blocks along the Green Line corridor, will be uh, compensated for the Palestinians through other land that will, be, that will be swapped with Israel, either adjacent to the Gaza Strip or in the southern part of the West Bank. That's already been agreed to, by the way, or, or that there is no contention about this. Jerusalem. West Jerusalem stays in Israel's hands. East Jerusalem, outside the wall, goes back to Arab sovereignty. The walled city, which is in East Jerusalem. For those who are familiar, the walled city is, is loosely divided into four quarters. You have a Muslim quarter, a Christian quarter, an Armenian quarter, and a Jewish quarter. And they talked about the Muslim and Christian quarters going back to Palestinian sovereignty. The Armenian quarter, with the exception of 12 houses, okay, I'm down to this detail, of 12 houses that overlook the Jewish quarter, the, the, the Western Wall in the Jewish quarter, with the exception of these 12 houses, it goes back to Palestinian sovereignty. And the Jewish quarter remains in. Uh, Israeli and then they differed over the haram, you know, what do you do with, with semantics? They differed over semantics. Do you, do you give the sovereignty above the haram to the Palestinians, below to the Israelis? It's, it's, it's purely semantic. Because in, in, in actual terms, it's, uh, it's with Palestinians. And you keep the city open. Okay? You keep the city open. I don't like to use the word united because it has no meaning. It, it, today, Israel controls all of Jerusalem. Is, is Jerusalem united today? Show me how many Palestinians venture into West Jerusalem or how many Israelis venture into East Jerusalem. It's not united today, so let's not talk about the United City. But let's talk about an open city that serves as the capital of the Jew side. Refugees. They talked about five options. A symbolic uh, uh, an agreed number of refugees to go back to Israel proper today, Israel already today, you have, you know, under family reunification, people going back to Israel. An unlimited number going back to the Palestinian state. Uh, this is the second option. The third option is refugees going back to the land that will be swapped with Israel or to the settlements that will be uh, vacated inside the West Bank. Uh, 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 by Israeli settlers. Repatriation to third countries such as Canada, Australia, United States, etc. Citizenship in the countries they are in, and that applies only to Lebanon and Syria because in Jordan, Palestinian refugees already are Jordanian citizens. And in all of the above options, compensation for the losses of the refugees through a fund that will be set up over you know, a number of years. Settlements, as I said, the settlements along the Green Line will be uh, given, will, will stay in Israel's hands, and the settlements inside the West Bank will be vacated. 20% of the settlements will be vacated, 80% are in settlements along the Green Line. That's the solution. Okay, so you come and, make, you know, you say, no, that's not exactly it, they did not exactly close it here and there. Yeah, I agree, <coughs> but that's the solution. Any solution is not going to be far different from what I have proposed to you. And this solution has already been negotiated among the parties. You, you ask me about terrorism. You say, okay, the moderates uh, are there, but what about you know, those who oppose peace? True. If you look at Israeli society, you're going to have a settler movement which will oppose all of this too. You will have people inside Israel who says no to any ceding of an inch of Eretz Israel, of an inch over Jerusalem. You're going to have that. 
But that is why you change the goalpost. If the goalpost is an agreement today between the Palestinians and the Israelis, it's not going to be possible, in my opinion. Because the Palestinians will tell you, this is an agreement with half of the Palestinians, and the Hamas supporters will not agree to it, and the Israelis will tell you, how can we see Jerusalem and all this when half the Palestinians don't want peace with us? If you keep this agreement as an agreement between Israel and the Palestinians, you are allowing the opponents of peace on either side a major role. If you talk about an agreement between Israel and the whole Arab world, however, Hamas, Hezbollah, and the settler movement will become minor players. Because on the Israeli side, the average Israeli citizen will understand the importance of an agreement with the Arab world through which his or her individual security will be assured forever. And in the Arab world, they will understand that finally there will be a Palestinian state uh, and an end to the occupation. And then moral and financial support for such organizations as Hamas and Hezbollah will, will all but disappear. And I believe that in such a context, you will have a clear majority on either side of this. Yes, yes. I, I was wondering, uh, what, do you, what do you think of the idea of the uh, Iranians, uh, Iraqis, and uh, Libyans, say, all the oil-rich nations? Do you think it help the uh, Palestinian people and uh, get support for the peace process through uh, Pay, paying for resettlement of those people. And, and this is just a comment. The young people in Jerusalem today don't care. They don't want to celebrate Shabbat because all the Israelis are in the Arab territories dancing on Friday night. And then uh, Saturday, uh, uh, this, the Arabs are in uh, Israeli areas dancing. That's really the interest of the young in that area. And it just aggravates me that one of the places that I was going to take, a girlfriend of mine, uh, exploded. There was an explosion there. And I was aggravated because uh, the young people don't care about religion as much as their elders do. And that seems to be the situation. But I if I, I, I'm not sure I understand uh, the question, sir. If what you are suggesting is that you're not suggesting that we take the Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza and put them in Libya and Iraq, are you? No, no. no I, didn't uh, mean yeah. I mean, the, the oil <laughs> which money of those countries go to the resettlement of the Palestinians. In, the, con naive. Sure. in the context of an agreement, in the context of, a, of an overall agreement, absolutely, you're going to have to use the oil money as well as money from the international community uh, to deal with some major problems. You cannot have a situation today where you know the, the per capita income of Palestinians is less than $1,000, and then you have Israel right next to them with $30,000. It's, it's a formula for disaster. Yeah. And the resettlement, and as you said, is going to involve major sums of money. That I don't see as a problem. The Jewish banks are going to help the Palestinians a little bit. Look, look, if you look at what this country alone has given Israel and Egypt alone, okay, since the Camp David Accord in 79, if you don't calculate the present value of money, if you just take the figures in absolute terms, $150 billion, okay, given only to Israel and Egypt over the course of the last 30 years. So, it is not, you know, it is not unfeasible for us to talk about a settlement, say, to the refugee problem of that order over 20 or 30 years. And not just by the United States, by the international community, by the Gulf states, by the European Union and others. A, 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 a fund where four or five billion dollars a year is given to the Palestinians over the course of the next 20 to 30 years to really improve their economic condition and get them up to par 
and establish a viable Palestinian state is not within, you know, it's, it's totally within reason. Last question. So, just a comment about the involvement of U.S. presidents in the peace process, and this is not in defense of the Clinton administration, but, you know, they were involved beginning in 93. Now, they came, they didn't initiate it, but they sort of helped along the way. Nevertheless, it didn't materialize at the end. But, but, but the, the question that I have for you is, what, because the peace process has not materialized so far, at least in the past three or four years, the question of nuclear Iran probably has become, if not more important in the Middle East, and what, if you want to call the moderate Arab relation to that, it's as important as the peace process itself. I mean, did we reach a point where the peace process is no more the central issue in the Middle East? On your first point, it is true that the Clinton administration was involved, but they were involved in the gradual approach. What I meant is that President Clinton only put forward a framework for final status solutions at the end of his term. Uh, the, the issue of Jerusalem, of uh, settlements, of uh, refugees was only tackled starting with Camp David, the Camp David summit of, in the summer of 2000. And then that's what I meant by, you know, by the late uh, involvement. As, as is today, President Bush today is attempting not a gradual approach, but is attempting to go for the full thing. Uh, you know, an overall solution that will uh, end the conflict, which, which, I mean, good luck, but <laughs> I, don't, I don't think it will happen. On uh, your, 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 your second point, uh, I'm sorry, can you remind me of it? It's, it's a question of nuclear Iran. On, on, on nuclear Iran. Yes, the fact is that today, in American uh, uh, foreign policy uh, positions on the Middle East, it's the Iran, you know, it's the Iran issue, it's the Iraq issue. Uh, and the Arab-Israeli conflict is today a tenth priority main, uh, with both campaigns, uh, and certainly with the Bush administration. I claim that this is a major mistake. If you go to the region, as you're probably from the region too. You, 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 you can immediately tell, just go and walk five minutes in the street and you can immediately know that the Arab-Israeli conflict is at the center of the radar screen of the Arab world. It's not Iran, it's not Iran. And it has, it has also implications on how you deal with Iraq and how you deal with Iran and how you deal uh, with the whole issue of, of terrorism. So yes, it is a reality today that America, America is not focused on the Middle East problem. But I am at least claiming this is a mistake and we need to bring back the focus of America on the Arab-Israeli conflict before it is too late. Well, I want to just take a minute uh, to thank the ambassador for speaking about his, his book today. Uh, to remind you all, it's called uh, The Arab Center, The Promise of Moderation. Uh, you should go down to the bookstore and get yourself a copy. And, uh, but before you do that, I hope you'll join us for a, a reception outside. But thank you very much. Thank you.